I have sat down and watched every single new anime series to answer the question, what is good, what is frosty, and what would I actually like to spend my time watching this season? Once again, like last season, we are crawling through the dredge, digging through the sands to try and find the diamonds without relying on any outside sources to tell me that something is worth watching. Because right now, in my mind, quality is not something you are told about. You have to see it for yourself. A little ironic since I'm telling you all what quality I have found rather than telling you to go and watch all of them yourself. But now that I have watched every single new anime series that is airing, all 31 of them, I welcome you to come with me, gentle viewers, on my original first reactions to them all. May I hold the same opinions as you as to what is frosty? That is only for you to say. So barring any interruption by large text, let's get into this winter season. But first, Glass Reflection would like to thank the sponsor for the video today, being the good people over at Surfshark VPN. A VPN is a way for you to help protect your privacy and what you view online as you surf and watch anime and videos on the web. Not only does it secure your data, encrypting it to help stop people from eavesdropping on your connection, but it also allows you to mask your location. Doing so allows you to bypass the region locking of a variety of streaming services, as not all streaming services are equal in what regions they service. So having a VPN like Surfshark can help you access shows that you might not be able to otherwise. Content blocked on services such as Netflix and YouTube can be accessible simply by connecting to a local server from the country that you would like to access. And of course, Surfshark is available on a variety of devices as well as your PC so you can stream your anime on the go if you so choose. There will be a link and a promo code in the description where you can sign up for a percentage off as well as an extra three months free because we like you guys so much. And best of all, if you try it out and you don't find that it helps, it's not doing what you expected, or it doesn't end up unblocking the content that you want it to unblock, Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, no questions asked. So thank you very much to Surfshark for sponsoring. Back to the video. All right, so let's set the ground rules and get them out of the way. This is going to be a long video covering a lot of shows, so don't expect my thoughts on any of these shows to be much more than skin deep first impressions. I did not look into the source material for these. Sometimes I may know if something was like based off of a mobile game or what have you, only because it wouldn't make sense otherwise. But if you want an in-depth analysis on any of these shows, then get in the comments and let me know. Just don't flood them, like upvote people who make your suggestion first, and it's far more likely that I'll actually see it that way. Since I did confuse a lot of people last season with my pass and tossed system that didn't work out, many people thought that pass was supposed to be a bad thing, and in retrospect, that's probably my bad because of the whole smasher pass thing, so it has a negative connotation. This season, it's hopefully a lot simpler. We have toss, which is bad, keep? which are things that are staying on my watch list for now, but could get tossed later depending on how things go, and keep, which I'm absolutely watching. I'm gonna watch them to the end, barring any, you know, like drastic changes in quality as the season progresses. And we're gonna try this system out for size. Perhaps I'll have even better labels next time, assuming I can think of better ones. I figured that the best way to organize this is to go alphabetically by title. This season, we're gonna use the Western title at first, if it exists, and then the Japanese title, if it doesn't. That way, I should have some semblance of impartiality because I'm ranking them in that way. But it also helps me make sure that I didn't miss anything. I did specify that we are only talking about new anime in this video, as depressing as that can be for some, because I too would love to discuss things like Witch from Mercury season two, the latest season of Magus Bride, or even that Konosuba spinoff. But have you seen the length of this video? If I included sequels, we would be here a lot longer than I would personally like to be. So I had to cut it off somewhere. And with that, let's get started. A Galaxy Next Door. There was one part early in the first episode, as the show was setting everything up, that had me chuckle for a moment. One of our protagonists, Ichiro, is placed in charge of his two younger siblings after their father died. And rather than find a job, since he was recently debuted as a manga artist, he decided to just go all in on his passion in order to make ends meet. And perhaps it's because Japan is very different than this 
than Canada. He offhandedly mentions that alongside his manga earnings, they also get money from an apartment complex that their family owns. Now, I do not wish to assume that he mismanages his money or the like, but considering how much money landlords can make here in Canada in supplementary income, the, the, the mention of it here really did feel like one of those articles where the author explains how to be successful in your life, only to offhandedly mention that they received like a half a million dollar house from their parents or a job at a venture capitalist firm, while still insisting that it's because of their hard work that their life turned out the way that it did. Rich people get all the luck. Anyways, on the one hand, A Galaxy Next Door seems to be a comfy series about a struggling mangaka who gains a skillful assistant. But of course, his new assistant is not all that she seems. She claims to be the princess of the star people, which is giving me Tsukihime flashbacks that I did not expect. She also has a needle-like appendage that our protagonist cuts himself on, which now apparently means that the two of them need to get married. Okay, color me intrigued. I'm not sure how I think about this whole star people thing just yet. Hopefully it can either be explained upon in an easily digestible way or pushed aside unless absolutely necessary, but we'll have to see how the show handles it from here on out. It is on my watch list for now as a solid keep. Hopefully it stays there. Alice Gear Agus Expansion. Not gonna lie, after only one episode, I'm not entirely sure what this series is, to be honest. Because first, we get like a sci-fi battle scene that feels like magical girls in space, but then it flips into this kind of idol culture comparison with a young girl who wants to become an actress, which I think is just this in-universe term for the giant robot pilots or gear users or whatever. But then we proceed to have this unqualified girl go through a series of challenges by other actresses and that's where my confusion comes in because it seems like all they're training her to do is to be an idol and not anything related to the sci-fi battle stuff at the start. Then I read the official description, which says, centuries ago, mankind abandoned planet Earth after the Vice, a race of mechanical aliens drove them from their home into life adrift in space. Now resigned to starships formed of pieces of Earth's shattered moon, the final hope for humanity lies in the hands of actresses, young women born with the ability to wield the only weapons that can harm the Vice. Alice Gears, mechanical suits that can finally turn the tide against the alien incursion. Okay, that is not, that is not the show that I just watched. Apparently, this is all a spin-off of a, a sci-fi action mobile game? Yeah, that's, again, this just isn't what this episode feels like. I didn't even get an indication that this wasn't Earth while watching the episode, let alone anything about a threat that humanity faces. None of that really comes across. I'm more in disapproval of the whiplash or rather mismatch of elements here. If it was a bit more consistent about its strong points, I might actually be interested to find out more about it, but I'm just not feeling it with this. We're tossing this one. <laughs> Turns out there was an episode zero that added a bunch more context, but I'm still keeping the toss rating because if it's so important that you need it for your world building, you just make that episode one. Not episode zero, and honestly, even episode zero didn't fix everything. So yeah, into the bin it goes. Next, Blue Orchestra. The story on this one isn't what stands out to me, so I'm gonna skip over that for a sec, and instead talk about the OP and its disjointed expectations. I realize that in most cases, people, myself included, realize that in the animation of an OP, it is not always indicative of the animation of the show itself which in some ways with this show is a good thing because a lot of the actual animation from the OP just seems to be someone morphing shape layers and after effects. Besides that though, the actual art of the intro is super clean, like someone took the time to vector art the whole thing type clean. But this is disjointing as I mentioned because the show itself is not like that. The designs of the characters are nothing to write home about, and for some reason, the lighting of the whole show just makes me feel like the series is about a decade older than it actually is. Now, the story is going to make people throw comparisons to Your Lie in April, which is a shame, not just because I don't think it's fair, you know, it's a violin show, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that comparison needs to be made, but also because Your Lie in April, objectively, is the better looking show, which is sad because it's nine years old at this point. 
So in Blue Orchestra, we have a protagonist, oh no, who was raised by his father to be a professional violinist, but due to his deadbeat dad causing a massive public scandal by cheating on his mom, he and his family don't really want to do anything involving music or the violin for obvious reasons. Despite this, Ono is still crazy talented and gets roped into helping a girl from his middle school learn the instrument, because despite being a tsundere about the whole subject, he still seems to honestly want to play the violin, and the story seems to be setting up a bit of a romance between the characters, while Ano himself finds new reasons for picking up the instrument again and enjoying himself and his life. Really, Ono seems like your typical wallowing in depression protagonist that just needs the, the power of music and friendship to save him. Hell, his character design is nearly identical to Ishigami from Kaguya-sama, despite being, you know, nowhere near as entertaining to watch, which I mean since Ishigami isn't even a protagonist of Kaguya-sama, that does say a lot to me. The show is not even streaming anywhere, which should also tell you something, because if like the big wig streaming companies don't think that this show is worth picking up, yeah, I agree. I'm tossing it. Dead Mount Death Play. A reverse isekai that killed off an interesting character in its first episode. Unless she comes back later, I don't know, lol. And if you think that that happens to be a major spoiler, you may be right. But it's not the most major spoiler that I could give from this first episode. And I am very tempted to tell that same major spoiler. Because honestly, it is the only thing keeping me from tossing this series in the figurative bin. Because this first episode has some fantasy character getting reincarnated in the modern world. And then chased around by a Yunogasai wannabe. And that didn't sell me. It wasn't until the literal final moments of the show's intro episode for the the show's twist not just this twist but also a scene post credits with a completely different tonal shift that actually made me think okay i'm not sure what this is going to do but i'm curious to see where you're going to go so it stays on the list for now but if it's just more of the same as we continue going well then i'm gonna toss it after that hell's paradise can I just say that since this show was the first time in this season where it happened for me, that seeing either the MAPPA or the Notaman A bumper immediately gets me excited, regardless of any other factors going into a show. It's like I already know that I'm going to enjoy myself far more than with the other things that I'm probably going to end up watching. Anyway. Hell's Paradise looks to be covering the story of a skilled assassin whose abilities make him exceedingly hard to kill. They showcase this by having him be a death row inmate and continually attempt to execute him, failing every single time. Unbeknownst to him, the executioner sent by the shogunate is actually looking for skilled individuals to be sent to an island said to be a paradise, but one from which most have not returned alive. Expeditions have been sent to the island in search of a rumored elixir of life that is said to come from there, but since no one is returning without becoming some kind of weird flower monstrosity, the shogunate is becoming more and more desperate, searching for skilled but expendable individuals to reach the island and find the elixir. Our protagonist is one such person, desperate for a pardon from the shogunate so that he may reunite with his wife and live a happy life together. At least, that's what he's hoping for. Who knows if that's actually how any of that is going to go for him. There are little moments of character development in this series that make me quite excited to see where it's going to go. Like at one point in episode one, the executioner finds herself in a situation where she needs to repeat herself multiple times, leading her to respond in frustration when the prisoner actually answers her questions. She recovers from this moment, but it is just this brief, tiny little thing where she loses composure that I latched onto as just a great moment to, to glimpse what she is thinking and focusing on, and I thought that, that that little bit there was really well executed. Overall, given that this is MAPPA in the production chair and it is a relatively solid opening episode, Hell's Paradise is firmly staying on my watch list. I got a cheat skill in another world and became unrivaled in the real world too. If I wanted to drop a series with very little reason, I suppose it could be this one. It's a standard power fantasy isekai where the protagonist finds a secret Narnia door to another world that allows him to gain magical skills and items with next to no real effort, and then also an ability that allows him to convert items into real world yen to bring back with him. Not only that, but skilling up in the fantasy world has real effects on his personal physique. And now, not only does he look like one of the most attractive guys in the world, but he also has a fairly unobtrusive way of gaining massive amounts of income. And 
To top it all off, he also gets invited to an extremely elite school in the real world by episode two. And by episode two, he ventures out into the fantasy world and saves a woman that will probably turn out to be a princess or some such nonsense so that he continues to be the luckiest guy in that world as well. There is nothing interesting here. Honestly, here's my verdict with this one, right? It's like a bag of chips. There are parts of the initial bits that I enjoy because that's what a power fantasy does to you, right? It makes you wish that you were the protagonist and in his shoes and living that perfect life. But I don't see myself going through the whole bag because I don't want to try and be nice about this show. Like say that I'm going to give it a chance when I really, as I am sitting here, do not see why I would want to continue. So we're tossing this one. Insomniacs After School. A cute little rom-com with good production value. We have two characters who are, as the title suggests, insomniacs who cannot sleep at night, but seem to still be able to function reasonably well during the day. They meet up at the school's somewhat abandoned observatory and eventually start an unofficial club where instead of trying to sleep, since that's just not happening, they go out onto the empty streets instead and just enjoy themselves. Kind of like Call of the Night, just without any, you know, supernatural elements and not as engaging of a protagonist pair. There are a few hints here and there that both of them would actually be able to sleep and cure their insomnia properly if only they slept in the same place together. But that is quite a ways past the hand-holding stage in a relationship, and they're not even at that point yet. Now, I don't have anything particularly against this series, and I might be interested enough to continue, so we're going to keep it on the list for now, but my lack of utter enthusiasm for it may lead to it being dropped sooner rather than later. Kamikatsu, working for God in a Godless World. Hey, stop me if you've heard this one before. Guy gets reincarnated into a fantasy world alongside a former goddess who has not even a fraction of her previous power, and our protagonist must now save them all from a horrible, poverty-stricken lifestyle. You did try to stop me at one point, right? Because I know that Code Asuba is getting older now, but at least there's that spin-off series airing at the moment, so it shouldn't be that far out of public consciousness. That said, Kamikatsu does quite a bit to set itself apart from others in a similar vein. Mostly by focusing on religion building, out of all things. And it actually goes quite a bit looter than your general episode of Kono. This world also lacks magic to a point. And the closest thing to it that we see on a regular basis is our little goddess's actual powers, which grow with every follower that she gains. The comedy in the series is a little bit hit or miss kind of thing though, and largely, at least that aspect was a miss for me. I'm still keeping it on the watch list for the time being, as I am curious to see how they attempt to keep this premise up for the whole season, but I have no idea how long it'll actually last. Kizuna no Alil. If previous seasons have taught you guys anything about my tastes in anime, hopefully you'll know that it takes a very specific kind of show involving idols to actually make me give a damn. And in this case, I do not care that they have built their whole fantasy sci-fi world around an actual VTuber idol, Kizuna Ai. That doesn't make this series about a young girl desperately trying to be an idol any more compelling to me. If anything, it feels worse, because the story would have even less to talk about without Kizuna Ai's inclusion. If you happen to be a Kizuna Ai super fan, good for you. I suppose this might be a must watch in your eyes, but for anybody else who doesn't care about Kizuna Ai, who doesn't care about this plucky protagonist, and doesn't care about idols in general, this is an easy toss. Bye bye Magical Destroyers. Okay, this one truly leaves me at a loss. It's got big early age Gynax energy, but without any of the actual drive that we saw out of them around that time. So in this world, a group in Japan called the SSC has moved to destroy all of Japan's otaku culture. Not just manga and anime, but all forms of otaku, from like train otaku to military otaku and everything in between. Our protagonist calling himself Otaku Hero alongside three actual legit magical girls team up to fight back. How do they do that? I don't know, by screaming a bunch, causing explosions and just doing random action stuff that never feels like it properly connects with anything that they are doing narratively. Problem is like I have 
no stake in this game. Like it's not trying to be a realistic interpretation at what some like actual fascist rule that bans various cultures might be because hey, magical girls are here. There's this floating creature for comic relief and the enemy is some kind of robot army. I think it says something that I actually had to turn up the speed of this first episode just to get all the way through. <laughs> I had to turn it to like 1.5x speed. So I feel like it's safe to say that it's a toss for me. Rule of cool though might apply to others and therefore you might consider it to be far more worthwhile. And in that case, if that is you, I am happy for you. But it is not for me. Mashell, magic and muscles. Welcome to the magic world. It's called the magic world because there is magic. Everyone uses magic and that's probably for the best because look, they don't have a river going down through their city. But otherwise it's like every other generic fantasy town from any isekai that we have ever seen. But it's not an isekai. That doesn't make it better. No, 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 no. This isn't a, a magical fantasy series about sword and sorcery. This is a series about muscles and how muscles are even better than magic, as proven by our protagonist who plans to enter a magic school despite not being able to perform any magic whatsoever, except for the magic of his expertly toned muscles. You know, for a show based on a popular Shonen Jump manga, I did honestly expect more. There's not much here even by Shonen standards, but if, you know, if that's what you want, if what you want is 20 minutes of ridiculousness every week, I'm sure you could do far worse, but for me, this is an easy toss. My Clueless First Friend A young girl named Nishimura is in the unfortunate position of being the school target for a large-scale bullying operation. Everyone teases her gloomy appearance and meek way of speaking, calling her the Grim Reaper. Classmates avoid her at best and at worst call everything that she interacts with cursed, like some kind of targeted cooties campaign or some such, but along comes Takeda, a transfer student and gigantic ball of joy who thinks being called the Grim Reaper is super awesome, actually, and does his best to befriend Nishimura. He's extremely bad at reading the room, but that's probably for the best because otherwise Nishimura wouldn't have a friend at all during her school days. The series so far is Pretty cute, and hey, in the first episode, our main characters have already passed the relationship marker of hand-holding. How degenerate of them. I'm keeping this one on the list for now because it'll either be a nice relaxing addition to my weekly routine or it'll be forgotten about among everything else. We'll see. My home hero. Well, I can honestly say that this one is not a story I either expected or am heavily disappointed in. A middle-aged father, also apparently a mystery writer, gets embroiled in the criminal underworld of Japan after a moment of fatherly passion leads him to kill the Yakuza boyfriend of his daughter who has been abusing her. As you might imagine, however, one does not simply kill a Yakuza member and get away with it, especially when said killing was unplanned and his buddies come looking for him. It has been a while since I have been exposed to an anime that did not revolve around like high schoolers, fantasy isekai worlds, magic or Japanese comedy that doesn't always land with a Western audience. So to see this thriller series start off reasonably strong is a breath of fresh air for me. That said, just because it's doing something different doesn't automatically mean that it'll end up being amazing. I've heard good things about the source material, Sure, but worryingly, said source material is still ongoing, which does not, it does not make me feel all that enthusiastic about where the anime may end up going and where it may end up ending. A drama of this nature really does benefit from knowing what the ending is already, rather than, you know, just attempting to try and get to someplace in an interesting way. But the anime can't do that because the manga hasn't even gotten to the ending yet. We'll have to see how long that it stays on my watch list, but for the moment though, I am keeping this one. My love story with Yamada-kun at level 999. Now, I mean, Right after saying that I appreciate the lack of high school drama or fantasy, I suppose that I am fine with this series, which is not technically that, just sort of adjacent to it. It's a romance anime with a woman named Akane who is suffering from heartbreak after her boyfriend dumped her for some other girl that he met in the MMO that the two of them played together. She tries to cope with this 
badly and ends up running into Yamada, an aloof pro-gamer who honestly just gets roped unwillingly into her life and keeps getting roped into it because, besides being aloof, he is also just honestly a good person who, while seeing Akane as a minor annoyance, does his best to be kind. I honestly expected the show's title to focus a lot more on the level 999 aspect and be like, and be more like MMO Junkie that by and large exists within the game. And while the MMO game here is a setting that the show uses, it, it's never really the focus. It's just like a background element, which I actually kind of like. I really enjoy having gaming and MMO things not being the driving force of the narrative, but just something that the characters enjoy playing. It's a thing that they do. So overall, this is a solid watch for me. And with luck, I'll actually keep watching it throughout the season. My one hit kill sister. But after that breather, we are back into Isekai territory, this time with a slightly different take on the standard trope of an OP protagonist. In this case, our guy gets sent to another world, or at least his soul does, while apparently his body is just in a coma back home. That's a weird dot hack comparison that I didn't think I'd be making today. And our protagonist's skills in this new world are basically zero, but he did have one OP cheat ability, summon older sister. Said older sister being the actual OP character, who is essentially Saitama with the fashion sense of Yoko Littner. And also a personality that barely exists, except for the fact that she is a massive bro-con and is creepily infatuated with her younger brother. So it looks like our main protag has to continue living in this world and use his sister to back him up, since she has like no desire or drive to do much of anything except dote on her baby brother and insta-kill anyone who insults him. While I will say that the the inclusion of best character design trait ever is present and it did attempt to sway my decision. Ultimately, I think I'm going to have to pass on this one. Opus Colors. I feel like I'm about to be a little bit unfair to this series. A lot of my watching this season was done under medication since I got sick immediately after Easter celebration. So I can't say that my mind was like 100% there for a bunch of these shows. But in this case, I do not feel like I was in the best place mentally for this kind of series. Opus Colors introduces such different changes from the standardized tropes that normally it would be refreshing, but honestly, I spent so much time trying to find my footing with the setting that I just couldn't get comfortable. This is a new world where a new type of technology has led to the development of perception art, not just visual landscapes, but ones with proper sensations using the five senses. The protagonists are either children of or friends of the children of the text founders, and they find themselves enrolled in a prestigious school with artist courses dedicated to this new technology. But like, I don't have much attachment to this, to this kind of art. This art that doesn't really look all that great, if I'm being honest. I'm sure that the characters find this fascinating, and maybe it looks better to them because they exist in this world, but I do not. Added on to the fact that the characters seem to have some sort of mysterious history with their parents who aren't around anymore, and there's some kind of trauma going on. All of this on top of one another makes it very hard for me to find like any kind of grounding in this world because nothing is necessarily familiar, except for the things that weren't particularly interesting in the first place. So this is an easy toss for me. Quickly though, let us take a break and give me a chance to collect myself before we continue with the next section, but also because I wanted to give shout outs to supporters of this channel over on Patreon. So an immense thank you especially to patrons like Wago221, Deluxe Flame, Sid Yamako, Rifen Bonaparte, Ross Emerson, Omar Showman, Ahigao Comics, and Hector Montemayor. We can't continue this without your support, so however much you are able to help, I am eternally grateful. Oshi no Ko. Honestly, before watching the near feature length first episode of Oshi no Ko, I didn't think I was going to enjoy it all that much. A reincarnation story about two idol fans who end up reincarnating as their favorite idol's children. A scene where our male protagonist struggles mentally with the idea of being nursed as a baby by his new mama. So many little details about this show have a particular bent to them that I'm not the biggest fan of. But having finished that first episode, I now know that there is much more to this series than just that, to the point where I feel like I will end up comparing it more to like Mushoku Tensei, a great series that I heavily enjoy, but because of some minor aspects to it, I find it next to impossible 
to recommend. The good parts of Oshinoko are those that ignore the more supernatural reincarnation elements. There are plenty of scenes here that attempt to showcase the darker side of Japan's entertainment industry, not just with situations of what might happen to an idol who happens to go off and get pregnant, but also the more cut and dry elements of like TV production, where a skilled actress might get her scenes cut, not because she was bad or they were bad, but because they would make the lead actress of the show in question look worse by comparison, and keeping them happy is far more important. There is a lot that I do want to say about Oshinoko, and it does have like this dark side to it. And it's for that reason that it is staying firmly on my watch list. Beyond that though, Oddly, I think I have to say it is one of my clear favorites thus far. Alongside this next one, Otaku Elf. Now this is a fun little series. 400 some odd years ago, more or less, an elven woman gets summoned to Japan for some unexplained reason and has either never been able to go home or has chosen for some reason to stay in Japan for all of these generations. She is immortal and has been the goddess of her shrine since being summoned. As such, she is being taken care of by a Miko shrine maiden. And at the start of our tale, we meet the 15th Miko, Koito. But she doesn't have the pleasure of serving a graceful fantasy deity as the elf Elda has taken to become somewhat of a recluse, and in the modern age that includes all of the negative neat stereotypes attached to it. This series seemingly is the relationship between the pair as Koito attempts sometimes successfully to pry Elda away from her recluse habits and actually performs her duties as goddess of the shrine. Also, if the OP is anything to go by, we're actually going to see more than one other elf and their relationship, so I am excited to see more of this. Usually every season I get like one really chill series that I just can't help but look forward to, and this season, this happens to be it. While I feel like the over-reliance on bashing the hikikomori nature of Elda will get tiring before long, I can still hope that it keeps this, that it helps keeps things in this series interesting as we go. So for now, it is solidly on my to-watch list. I'm keeping it. Pokemon Horizons, the series. Yes, this counts. I don't care that it'll end up having like a thousand episodes by the time that it probably ends, but Pokemon is rebooting its mainline anime for the first time ever, so you bet I'm gonna cover it. I won't say that I am disappointed by the initial first two episodes of this series. There are a lot of familiar things here that does make it clear it is Pokemon, but there is enough to this series that differentiates it from its predecessor. The only thing that I really wish wasn't missing was a proper semblance of a status quo, but that could just be forthcoming. In the previous Pokemon series, every time we entered a new era, there were slight changes to how things worked. It's a new region, Ash ditched his old lineup Sans Pikachu, he'd get new companions, plus Brock sometimes, and Jesse and James would always be there causing mischief as a wonderful blanket of normal. And honestly, the introduction of this new Pokemon heroine, Lyco, doesn't actually feel all that different from when a new female companion joined the show's roster in the past, except this time she's not playing second fiddle to Ash. So there is this little bit of unease here for anyone who may have watched Pokemon for like, you know, the last 20 years as we are now in uncharted territory for the first time ever. Is this show good? Sure, in that it's not bad, and Pokemon as a series has always been this kind of like average meh to its quality. But that's to be expected in any show that will probably go past several hundred episodes in length without breaking a sweat. There will be times it is absolutely amazing, and others where you question why some episodes were ever written in the first place, but that's the nature of the beast. So for now, I'm sticking with this one. Who knows how long I'm actually going to keep up with it because it will be on air far longer than just this one season. And I've always had like waves with my interest in Pokemon that rise and crash every couple of gens or so. So perhaps this might also break that. I'm not expecting anything amazing. I am expecting Pokemon. And with that bar, it is doing well so far. Rokudo's Bad Girl. Okay, so, high school drama set in a school full of delinquents, where the main character spends most of his school time getting bullied alongside two friends for one reason or another. He gets a magical scroll from his grandfather that's been passed down for generations, and this scroll places a symbol on his head 
that also makes any of the bad girls nearby suddenly fall madly in love with him. Which now not only includes virtually every female student at his school, but also the biggest, baddest bitch who doesn't even show up for class normally. Q, our meek protagonist, suddenly having to deal with all of these women throwing themselves at him. And also one who throws everything back. I'm not feeling it. There's something about the art style to this one, too, that just sets it off for me. Like, we are just one frame away from the lines of every character suddenly going haywire and becoming like a Jackson Pollock painting. Our protagonist comes off as the most stereotypical good guy yet meek ever. The kind of guy that just doesn't know what to do with this new power bestowed upon him. And I'm sure that there will be plenty of comedy to showcase the wacky situations that he now finds himself in. I say that I'm sure about that, but I actually have no real intention of confirming this for myself. Toss. Skip and Loafer. Even before starting this series, I had a feeling that I was going to enjoy it simply because of its title. The Thing and Thing naming scheme has worked wonderfully in the past as an indicator for shows that I enjoy. Sweetness and Lightning, Spice and Wolf, Yotsuba and... So despite me surfing my way, not just through one, but two intro episodes, because I felt like I, I couldn't help myself, I'm really at a loss to explain why I like this particular series with reasons that I haven't used to discredit others in the past. Like, I think the best thing about it so far is not just the lead characters, but the variety of supporting characters that make the episodes feel lived in. Generally speaking, Skip and Loafer doesn't seem all that much more than like your run-of-the-mill high school drama slash romance slash slice of life thing. But our protagonist finds herself in unique situations with an interesting balance of being an extremely competent student, but also a very anxious individual. Someone who has her life planned out heavily and can describe said plans with extreme confidence, but also one who cracks even under moderate pressure when those plans start to fall through. So like a regular person, am I right? The benefit about watching a protagonist like this is that you don't have to worry about whatever mask that a person might have, because the audience always gets to see what is behind that mask, unlike, you know, a real person. But Skip and Loafer is having a go at showcasing how, while the protagonist might be an open book to us, the secondary characters are anything but, not only for us, but for heroin as well. Whether it ends up being a fluffy slice of life more than anything else, or a wonderful drama that unfolds over the course of the season, I think that I'm in this one for the long haul. Onto the watch list you go. Heavenly Delusion. All right, well, I wasn't expecting some weird cross between story elements of Promised Neverland and The Last of Us, but here we are. Actually, no, that's not a good comparison at all, because while it may be a post-apocalyptic setting like The Last of Us, it's not a zombie post-apocalyptic setting like The Last of Us. It also has laser guns. So it's like Fallout. The story of Heavenly Delusion thus far splits between two locations. First, post-apocalyptic Japan, where two young adults are traveling by themselves to a place called Heaven. In this wasteland, they scavenge for food and materials, scare off some ruffians with the aforementioned laser gun, and take shelter with a lady who owns a shotgun that may or may not be used against a massive monstrosity of a bird that exists in this world now. The second location is a technologically advanced one that likes to take care of children sheltered from the outside world, who know nothing about what exists outside of the walls of where they live, to the point where most of them don't even believe that anything actually exists outside. So it's like Fallout. Unlike other shows this season that don't start in one of the more common settings that anime has been using this past decade, Heavenly Delusion is at least nice enough to stay just grounded enough so that we can get our bearings while still being able to have enough unexplained about the world to make us question what is going on and why in a comfortable way. It's one of those situations where as much as I hate the overuse of tropes, I can still be thankful for them if used right to help act as like narrative shortcuts in some ways. Here, we don't know what happened to this world, why there seems to exist a place that dodged the mass amount of death and destruction that took place, why our two characters are trying to reach a place called heaven, and if said heaven is that safe location that we see in the other half of the plot. Like, there are lots to take in, even with just one episode, and I am happy to see that this show is going to stay on the list, probably for the rest of the season. 
The Aristocrat's Otherworldly Adventure, Serving Gods Who Go Too Far. Here's the thing, people, right? Specifically people who write Isekai. If you're going to go so far to the point that the main protagonist realizes that they've been isekai and are aware of all of the tropes that are now available to them, at the very least then, right, add in enough differences to make your story unique. Otherwise, it's just like your protagonist screaming, Hey, this story that you're watching is just like everything else. Which then makes me question why I'm even watching this. High school student gets stabbed outside a convenience store and isekai into the body of a three-year-old aristocrat. Not that it matters, because we almost instantly time skip to his noble baptism where he speaks to the gods and gets max level abilities and stats. So what is he going to do with all of that power? Become an adventurer, because of course he is. I can't recommend a series that has been done before and better, especially when I feel like it's not even trying to be unique. Oh, the gods favor you over every other noble? That's not unique. That's just an excuse for power fantasizing the main character. I'm tossing this one. Next. The Cafe Terrace and its Goddesses. Young university student inherits a cafe by the beach from his late grandmother, and during his initial inspection of the place finds that it's currently being inhabited by five gorgeous female employees who have been living there for some time. Their meeting goes less than ideal, and the first episode involves him threatening to toss them all out, and they respond by attempting to convince him not to by dressing up scantily, using maid cosplay, and even getting the shy one drunk so that she starts to strip in his bed at night. All of this fails, however, though, and he is eventually convinced to keep the cafe for a time, not because of the goddesses who live there, but because of some forlorn attachment to his late grandmother. I honestly cannot remember the last time that I watched such a traditional harem series before. It's an old genre, sir, but it checks out. I'm not entirely sure if I'm going to clear this series to stay on my watch list, however, because if you know things about me, you might know that harems and I don't get along. Far too often, this genre relies on coincidence fan service to pull in the viewers. And honestly, if I wanted to watch scantily clad anime women for 20 minutes, I would rather toss this in the bin and watch some legit hentai, not any of this half measure nonsense. But I mean, if that's what you want, Far be it for me to dissuade you. So with that in mind, like I'm okay with giving it another episode to, to show itself, mostly because our protagonist seems to be somewhat resistant to the genre's usual fan service nonsense. But if he succumbs to it, then the show will need something far more than just well animated body types to keep my attention. So it's on the list for now, but it's on thin ice. The dangers in my heart. High school romance with a unique enough premise. Protagonist Kyo Taro is fascinated by all things death and murder, spending not an insignificant amount of time in the opening scene by imagining himself murdering fellow classmates for the heinous crime of bumping into him. But the one he wants to kill most is the class idol. How dare she be so attractive and look down on him? But wait, does she really look down on him? When they meet up later, she barely acknowledges his existence, but she doesn't necessarily treat him horribly, you know, besides asking him to throw out some garbage in the trash, even though she's within visual range of the trash can, and that's a little odd. But Kyotaro doesn't seem to mind, and over time he finds himself not wanting to vent his murderous frustrations upon his classmate, Anna, but rather anyone that inconveniences her. He's on the fast track to becoming Yandere, is what I'm saying. which is not something I was expecting, so I'm curious to see what else the show has up its sleeve. If that happens to be nothing, then yeah, it's gonna get the ax, but for the moment, it's gonna stay on the list, and I wanna see where this goes. The legendary hero is dead. Oh boy, okay, so uh, let's take the usual fantasy tropes of having a legendary hero that is fated to save the world as chosen by some magical sword. Then let's have him be so dumb that he falls into a Team Rocket-esque trap and dies in his introductory scene. Well, show's over, except no, it's not. That's just the name of the show. So obviously that's not how this is going to end. The trap in question was made by our protagonist, Toka, who, not really caring about the duties of the hero, set up this trap to help protect his town and his farm. But because it was his trap, he ends up taking the blame for the death of the hero. And one of the hero's friends, a necromancer, decides that since Toka was responsible for the hero's death, that he, obviously, is a suitable replacement. So she dumps his soul into the hero's body, and now he is charged 
with saving the world in the hero's place. Really, a lot of this seems super dumb, like even in just how simply stupid the original hero was and the attitudes from literally every character. So will I be watching the series? Of course I will, because Toka is a man of culture and I respect him for that. At least enough to not write off the show immediately at the start and probably wait a bit before realizing my mistake and then tossing it immediately at that point. The Marginal Service. What, what did I just watch? Okay, so the best way that I can describe this series is that it is some kind of mix between Men in Black and Gatchaman. The official synopsis says that the Marginal Service is a motley crew of men, a woman, and a squirrel as they are tasked with hunting down aliens. Our protagonist, Brian, is their new recruit. Man, is that Western protagonist name really throwing me there. And then you add on to the fact that his full name is Brian Knight Raider, like some kind of 80s action protagonist. And really that just takes the cake. But then they all wear outfits like construction workers in the rain and they're multicolored like Sentai uniforms. There is nothing here that actually is driving me to continue. Like sometimes absurd things can be interesting and unique in a like WTF kind of way, but I don't feel like that applies here. I don't care if Brian is voiced by Mamoru Miyano, that is not enough in this case. Like if you are looking for some kind of absurd action series, then sure, check it out, but I'm passing on it. Next, Too Cute Crisis. A simple lighthearted premise, at least it is, at the start. Group of aliens come to Earth, presumably to destroy the inhabitants of the planet and mine the remainder of the landmasses for minerals and materials. But due to protocol, they are required to send a researcher down to determine if there's anything actually valuable about the civilization in question before blowing it all up. So one of the alien commanders, who is also the head researcher, goes down and determines that, yeah, there's nothing of value with human civilization, which is a big mood. But before she takes back off again, she is asked to sample the cuisine of the planet. So she just picks the first place nearby, a Japanese cat cafe. A normal cafe, but one with a bunch of cats roaming around. Unfortunately for our researcher, cats are just too cute. And what follows is a series of quick scenarios where our protagonist becomes seriously enamored by these little balls of fluff, only to discover other cute animals like dogs. Presumably she will need to take great care from now on and attempt to lead on the mothership in orbit so that, you know, everything stays fine, but also, you know, they don't really need to kill everything on the planet, right? But knowing the comedic tone of the series, she probably just needs to like show everyone a cat to get them all on board. I wouldn't say that there is anything extremely remarkable with the series, but as a cat lover myself, I totally get where the protagonist is coming from and as such will gladly continue watching her adventures. Onto the watch list you go. Run for Money, The Great Mission. Watching this one reminds me of like late 90s, early 2000s shonen for some reason. Futuristic fifth element like world where the planet has gone to crap, but only close to the surface. The elite live above the smog and live quite peacefully. They do, however, seek entertainment. That from shows like Run For Money, where contestants must run to survive from a variety of challenges in order to win the prize. Our protagonist, despite being from the lower city, successfully manages to join through sheer skill and must now face off against other competitors in this competition as they are hunted by Matrix-like agent beings and who knows what else that will get thrown at them. My biggest problem here is that the show seems to be keeping the rules and game plan of Run For Money close to its chest, but at times I feel like this is a detriment. Yes, we know our protagonist just needs to keep running away and keep running in order to win, but it's not really explained how long he has to run. And when the game starts to shake things up, there's no explanation as to what's going on, despite the fact that all of the characters seem to know what's going on and what they must now do, presumably because they have either played the game before or have at least watched it on TV, but we don't know Jack. I don't see much in this series that's actually gonna keep me interested. And in some cases, I feel like it's actively pushing me away. So I'm gonna toss this one. Why Raylena ended up at the Duke's mansion. If it wasn't for the fact that our protagonist isn't a villainess here, 
I would like lop it in with all of the other villainous adaptations as of late because the story is quite similar. Protagonist gets isekai into a novel that she once read as a secondary character that unfortunately is supposed to die so that the heroine of the novel has a mystery to solve. But as our protagonist only recently died, she has no intention of dying for a second time. So she's going to use the knowledge of the story to change events in her favor. Her first big play is making a deal with the Duke, the male protagonist of the novel, because he has the power to help break off the engagement with our protagonist's fiance, the man who apparently poisons her in the novel. And if the engagement is broken off, then the initial path to death goes with it. But perhaps that won't be the end of the story. Well, almost certainly it won't be because that would be too quick. While its reliance on some common tropes to hand wave its setting are a little tiresome, like getting reincarnated into a novel that you read and not having some like trickster god be involved, that's, that's a little weird, but it's happened before. I can't accept these things in lieu of the story, like trying to come up with everything on its own and just being too obtuse, especially since this is aiming to try to be some kind of like semi mystery plot. Not much of a mystery when the protagonist knows the story, but every major change that she makes the story, I would assume, will change with it. And then her knowledge will become less and less useful as we go. How the anime continues with that and makes things interesting will be key. So I'm going to keep watching for now. If only for me. Yuri is my job. Finally, we have this. Instead of attempting to pull off a stereotypical Yuri shoujo romance, we instead do exactly that, but with the pretense that everything is an act for patrons at a themed cafe. Our protagonist gets forcefully roped into the situation through somewhat dishonest means as she accidentally collides with the cafe's manager, who at first is willing to just let everything Go. It wasn't a real injury or anything, they just bumped into each other, whatever. But then, our protagonist shows herself to be exceptionally cute, and suddenly, oh, oh yes, no, we're gonna need to force her to work at our cafe. That's the part of this series that I'm not the biggest fan of. Hime, our protagonist, is only working at this cafe as an obligation to the girl that she bumped into, but it is all done through false pretenses. And now she has to work with another girl and they have to pretend to be friends in front of customers despite this other girl not seeing her as anything but a bother. Well then, you know, just let her go if you don't want to work with her. Oh, well, she needs to take the manager's place because she injured the manager. Look, the manager's in a cast now. Oh yeah, a cast that she can completely ignore at her discretion. Like the lies and the forced servitude here are what really annoy me. Otherwise, I will say it is a cute, little premise and the characters beyond their sleazy actions are interesting. So it's it's starting on the list for now and we'll see if the aspects that I can't stand fade into the background or if they become even harder to ignore. So that's it for our show today. With any luck, you will have a greater amount of knowledge now about what is airing this season and what you yourself will want to watch. If possible, I'm going to try and find a way to link in the description all of the places where you can find these shows for legal streaming. But if that fails, I mean, just Google the show name and, and, and add streaming to the end of it. It shouldn't be too difficult for you. So subscribe if you haven't, hit the bell if you enjoyed the video, and until next time, Whenever that may be, ladies, gentlemen, and others, watch more anime and stay frosty.